Good morning. It is good to see you this morning. Good to have you here. We are starting a series on Revelation this morning, which we'll get to in just a couple minutes. Um, real quick, no, I did not have my surgery, and no, they don't know when it's going to happen, and so we'll leave it at that, okay? Just keep praying, so we'll go with that. I mean, that's all I can say. They didn't have a place for me to stay overnight. They didn't have any, enough nurses to take care of me. They were going to bring in the National Guard. I said, no, they're not going to take care of me. <clears throat> I got a bayonet here. I'll help you. I'll cut this one open. No, no this is not going to happen. You know. um, I do want to say for those people who are watching online that if you want to get the, uh, the same notes we're using here in the uh, sanctuary this morning, they're available at going to sunrisechurch.com, clicking on the media button, and going down, and they're downloadable. We have the, uh, the bulletin for this morning. We also have the chart we'll be covering, and there are four of these charts we'll be using throughout this set, uh, study of Revelation. So if you want to get those, those are available in line at sunrisechurch.com under the media, the 2022 messages. We are starting the book of Revelation this morning. And I want to start by saying this morning that I'm going to cover the book of Revelation from a point of view, how does it apply to us? I'm not going to go through all the speculation that all the different points of view have. I know all those. I've written on them. Uh, but I want to tell you this morning that this is a book, this is a study for how does it apply to us? What do we do with the book of Revelation? What's it say to us? And we're going to cover from beginning to end, and I'll show you that here in just a couple minutes. But I want to say that in covering the book of Revelation, we're going to kind of approach it like going to the ocean and going swimming. So you go like, well, what's that got to do with it? You know, when you get to the ocean, you're going to go swimming. You walk in and you get your feet wet. And you go a little bit further and you're up to your knees. And you keep going till finally you can't touch bottom. And that's when my wife says, oh, no, we don't get that far. My wife didn't even put her feet in the water. Although I have to tell you that we were in Hawaii a few years ago. We were in Hamanea Bay, I think it was. And we were swimming around, had snorkels on. And she got so enthralled that she was swimming, and I had to grab, go out and catch her. She was going to the ocean, man. She was just, she was gone. She talked a while ago about be, having her head down when she walks. She keeps her head down when she swims. Boy, she living. So, so we're just going to, this morning we're going to get our feet wet. And that'd be the same of next week. We've got to do the introduction. We've got to get through some of the stuff at the beginning of the book of Revelation. I want to make sure you understand what's happening. I'm not going to jump into the, the, the deep end at this particular point. But we will get there. And I guarantee you, we will cover that materials that's there at that particular point. So this morning, let's get our feet wet. Now, I'm not much of a hot pepper person. I don't know if anybody else here or something like that. I go in the store and I go to get the salsa. It has to say mild. You know, and if I by accident were here recently, we got some salsa and I got the medium by accident. And oh my goodness, it's like, oh my, what have I done, you know? You know, when you talk about peppers and you talk about salsa and mild, medium, hot, stuff like that, uh, a bell pepper gets zero on the pepper scale. Did you know that? There's no heat in a bell pepper. I love bell peppers. They're great. And the one that I like next is banana peppers. The banana peppers rank, rank 500 on the scale. And that's about as tall or further I can go as a banana pepper. And I got to be careful, but I, I like them occasionally. And then you go up on the scale and you go to the, the next one up on the scale after the banana pepper. Um, is goes up to, and I want to get this one right here. This, uh, um, we go up to the jalapeno, excuse me, the habanero. And the habanero goes at, on the scale, is, um, is 350,000 on the scale. So you've got zero of the bell pepper. You've got um, the banana peppers at 500. And the habanero is at 350,000. You start to think, that's pretty hot. That's 700 times hotter than the banana pepper. But folks, you haven't done anything. There is one that keeps going up and up. And finally, you get to what is called the hottest pepper in the world today is the Carolina Reaper. <laughs> you like that name? The Carolina Reaper. In fact, um, it's advertised. Uh, it, it, Carolina Reaper on the pepper scale is about 2,200,000. You know, so that's a long way from a habanero of 350,000. In fact, it's 4,400 times hotter than a banana pepper. And um, one website advertises the, the Carolina Reaper this way. The Carolina Reaper has a sweet and fruity flavor with unrelenting face-melting heat. <laughs> I don't need face-melting heat. 
You know, I can just imagine with this uh, with this high level hernia I've got right here, what that would do for me. You know, you wouldn't have to do surgery. They just wouldn't have anything to do surgery on. It would just be gone at that particular point. You can go on the Internet, and you all probably already know this, and you can watch people eating the Carolina Reaper pepper. Uh I just, you know, you see them eating that thing and their, their eyes are watering and they're screaming and they're on the floor in pain and they got grabbing milk and uh, some of them are throwing up and it's, it's just like, why would you do something like that? You know? At 2,200,000, it's not the hottest pepper though. There's a pepper that's hotter that they don't sell. They only sell the sauce from it because the pepper is so hot that this, it will literally melt through your, your intestines and it fell through it. It's called Pepper X. And Pepper X comes across at about 3,300,000. And they say that it just, just dissolves. You know, you're, you're a, your life is coming to an end, you know, if you got that. Now, you may be asking why I'm talking about these this morning, but I want to share with you this morning that when we come to the book of Revelation, it's hot sauce. In fact, I want to read a statement by uh, Tim Dower in his book, Revelation, uh, Leaving Speculation Behind. And by the way, that's a good book for the first third, and after that, just forget it. So if you want to buy something good for the first third, that's a good one. You want a whole book, just skip it. But here's what Tim says. Revelation isn't comfort food. It's the hot pepper sauce for the soul. And it's time for the church to dig into the meal. And that's where my, my illustrations come from this morning. That's what I'm talking about. We're going to be going into the hot pepper sauce, the pepper X of the book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And it's the book that most people don't ever do anything with. They don't ever touch or think about. And so you and I, we're going to go there, but in order to go there, we have to go there little steps at a time. So this morning, as I said, we're going to get our feet wet. We're going to do a baby step this morning. We're going to start with you who are here in the sanctuary. We're going to start with that chart that was in the middle, and we're going to fill it out so that you can understand the book of Revelation a little bit better and a little bit uh, um, understand it better at this particular point. Now, here is the, the, the flow chart for the book of Revelation. And I'll start by saying most of the time we just think of the book of Revelation as 22 chapters from beginning to end. It starts in chapter 1, it goes to chapter 22, and most people don't even think about, well, what's it look like? Actually, it should look more like this. It's actually four parts. And when we come to the book of Revelation, when we start breaking it into the four parts, it begins to start making sense for us. And the first part of the book of Revelation is the introduction. It's the vision of Christ. It's the first chapter. We're going to spend two weeks here. And when we talk about spending two weeks here, we're going to talk this morning. We're going to go over only the first three verses this morning. And next week, at the end, I'll tell you what all we're covering. But next week, we'll go from verse 4 to verse 20. We'll cover the rest of that chapter. Most of the time, people rush through. Most of the books I've been reading, they rush through this. They give it a quick overview. The problem is this is the foundation for everything we need to know about Revelation. Next week, we will cover the key point of why Revelation and who wrote Revelation and what it's coming from and what it says to us and where what the, the point of view we need to have in reading it and understanding it. So it starts with the vision of Christ. It is the, the, the first chapter. It's one chapter. The second thing that comes up in the book of Revelation is a letter to seven churches. Now these letter to seven churches, we're going to spend two or three weeks here. But when I talk about the letter to seven churches, I can explain them best. Have any of you ever gone online and looked up the reports from restaurants, those restaurant reports, the inspection reports? I did it this week. There are a lot of restaurants that have like one thing wrong or two things wrong. And I'm reading this restaurant, and by the way, it's over the west side, and it was a Mexican restaurant, so they serve hot food. But they had 85 red elements wrong in their thing. You know, it was like right through the roof. You know, It's like, okay, walk in here, breathe, get sick, and go home. You know, That's what it sounded like to me, you know? But so, but when you read online, you see those those uh, those reports. You know there are good reports, there are bad reports, there are all different types of restaurant reports. When we come to the Book of Revelation in the seven churches, this is from Jesus Christ, and He is sending a restaurant report to each church. He's going in and He's looking at each church, and some of the reports come back in the seven churches. Great. 
And some of them come back in the middle. And one of them comes back with 85 things wrong. That's what it is. Jesus has nothing good to say about that church. And so when we look at these, uh, we're not going to take them one at a time, as most times they do in books and most pastors do when they preach. You can do it that way. We're going to take them all together. And when we take them all together, I have a chart for you, and I'll show you how they apply. But the key here is we're going to take these seven churches, and we're going to apply them to our church and all churches in the world today. And you're going to see where the church, a lot of them are lining up at and what, what's happening in these churches. And so we're going to do that, but we're going to go a step further. We're going to apply it to ourselves, and we're going to stop and ask the question, where do we line up? You know, if, if Jesus Christ was sending us this inspection report, where do we line up in that whole process in the inspection report? And so we're going to do that, and we'll take, like I said, two or three weeks at that particular point in time. That's still being worked out at the end. And then that's chapters 2 and 3, and then comes the big section, one of the two big sections of the book of Revelation. And the next section of the book of Revelation is four parallel prophecies. And what I want you to understand is I put them up here. There are seven seals, seven trumpets, seven angels, seven bowls. They line up next to each other. And each one of them has an introduction. In fact, we'll spend one week, maybe two weeks, on just the introductions to these four sections because it's important for us to understand and see. In this four-week period, I will tell you why the Holocaust happened in Germany because of this right here. And I think you'll be surprised. But I'm also saying that these introductions are there for a reason to these four sections, and we'll look at those. We'll look inside of these four sections, and what most of you are here for this morning, I have to say, is kind of like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Now, most of you have seen that movie. It came out in, I think, 1938, 1939. It's one of the very first movies that colorized. Remember, at the beginning, it's black and white, and you get the land of Oz, and it turns the color. You know, I thought that was so cool the first time I saw that. Wow. But you know, Dorothy is in the Wizard of Oz, and she's already met the Scarecrow. She's already met the, uh, the, um, uh, the Tin Man. By the way, she meets the Scarecrow. This aside, has nothing to do with the message. I just want to tell you. One of the greatest lines in movie history is right there when she meets the Scarecrow. The Scarecrow is saying, I want to go get a brain. And Dorothy looks at him, and most people never catch it. The next time you see it, you'll remember it. Dorothy looks at him and says, well, how can you talk if you don't have a brain? And the Scarecrow says... Well, people do it all the time. Dorothy, the scarecrow, the, uh, the, the tin man, and they come to the edge of the dark forest. Remember that? And they say, what's in there? Lions, and tigers, and bears. Oh, my. You've seen it, right? And they start moving forward, and they say it faster. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Lions and tigers. And all of a sudden, roar, and the lion comes out, and the tin man falls over, and the scarecrow loses his stuffing. And Oh, it's just terrible. And finally, Dorothy just has to go smack that lion on his nose. Remember that? Most people, when they come to the book of Revelation, they're thinking, dragons and beasts and false prophets. Oh, my. Dragons and beasts and false prophets, oh my. And they focus in on all this negative. They focus in on 666 and getting the mark of the beast. They focus in on Armageddon, which is right there at the 16th chapter, just before we get to the end of the section. We'll look at the lion. We'll look at the you know, lions yet. Yeah, lions, tigers, and bears. I want you. Yeah, we'll look at those too. No, we're not going to look at those. We're going to look at the. We're going to look at the dragons. We're going to look at the beast. We're going to look at the false prophet. We're going to look at the harlot. We're going to look at the meanings of these things. We're going to talk about six six six. We're going to talk about the mark of the beast. We're going to talk about the mark they never talk about the mark of Christians and being marked for Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about the, the we're, we're, at one point, I will stop and tell you those eight key words that are the words that describe the entire book of Revelation. If you know those eight words, you know everything you need to know. But we'll come to this four parallel prophecy section, and we, we're going to tell you that, you know, Dorothy goes in there and, and they're just terrified until they discover the truth about the lion. I'm going to tell you, we don't need to be terrified of what's being put down here in the book of Revelation. In fact, I go back to what it says in Revelation 1, 17 and 18, which we'll be talking about some next week, where Jesus Christ is speaking. He says, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died to behold on my life for more, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Jesus says, Don't worry about it. What I'm about to tell you is it, it, important information, but don't be afraid. 
And so here we are this morning that we see this section which is so vi vi valuable for us. But I want you to see it as it applies to us, as it with all the, the hype taken away. Where you don't have to be like Dorothy standing at the edge of the dark forest and going, Oh my, I'm afraid. Because we don't have to be afraid. The book of Revelation was written for us to understand. And then we come to the last section, which maybe we're not quite, well, we say it was the last section, but it's actually, you know, chapter 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22, these six chapters, we come to the end. This is a section that ties up the entire book of Revelation, ties up all of history, ties up all of eternity. This book, I call it a conclusion, but it's actually a conclusion in the beginning. It's a conclusion of all sin, all of this world, everything is here. He tells about what happens to the beast, what happens to the dragon, what happens to the false prophet. He tells what happens to Satan. At the same time, he turns around and he says, look, I want to tell you if you're a believer, he says, there's good news. There's eternity for you. He turns around and says, I'm going to tell you about the new heaven and the new earth. And so the book of Revelation is a book which is a, a, a report, you know, to the churches, which we'll talk about. It is a prophecy, but a prophecy far different than most people see or understand. And the book of Revelation is there for us. It's broken into four parts. And if you start by there, seeing that this morning, understanding there are four parts of the book of Revelation, we've already started to break it down. And so this morning, we're going to do the first part of the introduction and then I'll tell you where we're going next week at the very end. But I want to tell you something, folks. This is the hot pepper sauce. This is the pepper X we're talking about when you come to Revelation. It's the book that most people, most people go like, it's too hot for me. I'm not going to touch it. Well, I want to tell you something, folks. It's not. And it can be easily understood. And that's my goal in this series, to take you from the point where you don't want to read it or understand it to a point where you do. So let's get started this morning in the study of the book of Revelation and do a brief introduction of these three verses. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants and things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to a servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in him, for the time is near. Shall we start? This morning, we're doing the introduction, so I've got to do a couple of things before we actually get to that prophecy. But let's make sure that you understand, and we're going to talk about the audience, and we're going to talk about the author, and we're going to talk about the word apocalypse, and then we're going to take a look at those three verses we just had here. When we talk about the audience... John writes this in about 95 or 96 A.D., and that's pretty strong for anybody who's got a conservative point of view. They almost all agree in that. And he says it's to be read and heard as a blessing. To understand why he says this, he's not just saying like you and I to, to read and hear it. You and I, the people in this room, I'm going to say we're probably 100% readers. And my son pointed out to me recently, he says, you know, if you read, you can't unread, you can't stop reading. Drive, drive down the road, you see a sign. You can say, I'm not going to read that sign. That sign, your mind reads that sign. Your eyes do it. It's something you do. You cannot not read. But if you cannot read, it is the most frustrating world in the, a frustrating world to live in. I want you to think about it. We've had twice this happen to us in the 25 years I've been here that someone came to this church who couldn't read. And I do this a lot, or for the people online, this a lot, which you can't see, so that's all right. You know, we have notes, we have things to read, things to follow. And people who come here who cannot read are frustrated beyond belief because to them, it's just a blur. In 95 AD, most of the people who lived in uh, Rome, uh, the, the big cities and the Roman cities, the, the Greek cities of that particular time, they lived in what were called, and the word is insula. We, the, the closest thing would be like an apartment, but they're really not apartments because our apartments are nice. These were just little square boxes made out of wood. Sometimes they, the, the rooms would be divided up by curtains. And people lived in there. They cooked in an open fire in there. They had a little hole in the roof sometimes. They had a sanitation bucket in the corner. And when it was full, they'd take and dump it out in the streets outside of their house in a little ditch that ran down through the cities. And probably about 90 to 95% of the population could not read. 
They were, uh, as one person put it, uh, this is where lifespans are short, health care is shaky, and economic trouble, trouble is perpetual. To tell you what it was like, to, most of you have heard about the great fire in Rome that took place on July, let me see, I've got July 18th, uh, year 64. It started one evening down by the Colosseum and began to burn. And they couldn't get the fire out because all they have is these little tinder boxes. Most of you heard last week about the fire that was down in, uh, I think it was California that started and took off and went across there and it burned 1,500 homes in one night. The people barely got out with their lives. Well, imagine a city made out of just wooden, dry sticks and boards covered with uh, not more than that. Inside, there was, you know, there's there one against each other, little thin alleys in between. Thousands of people living like that in Rome. It began to burn, and six days later, they finally brought it under control. What you don't read sometimes is, is that it went under control for that night, and part of the next day, it started to burn again. It burned for three more days. It actually burned for nine days. When it was done burning, 70% of Rome was gone. Tens of thousands of lives had been lost. And the emperor, Nero, who we've all heard about, they say Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Really, the truth is, there's nothing he could do. Everyone was trying to put out the fire the best they could, but when it was all done, Nero said, it's not going to be my fault. I know, I'll blame the cult, the Christians, and say that they started the fire to try to burn down Rome to destroy us. But this is where people lived, in these small apartments, and they could not read. And I want to share with you, that's why this book says, blessed are those who read and those who hear, because 95% of them could only hear it. They could never read it. And so God was saying and, and, and to these people, those that can read, please read it. When, the, when this book was finished, when John sent it out to the seven churches before it was put out beyond that, it was brought to the church, and a reader came to the front of the church and took the book and set it down and began reading it, whether it was in a scroll or whether it was pages. I don't know at that particular point. It probably may have been scroll, a scroll. To read a book of Revelation takes about an hour and a half if you read it straight through. And they would have gathered around for this message from the great St. John, which we'll talk about in a minute, and somebody who could read, the reader for the church, possibly the pastor, possibly somebody else, would read this message. You start with the introduction and the seven letters of the churches. And when we get to the seven letters of the churches, I have to tell you, those, some of those pastors, they must have just wanted to cry. They were so embarrassed. But it would be read aloud and the people would be listening. And I want to share with you that if God intended for people in the first century who were basically uneducated to understand or be able to see something there, He expects us to see something there too. And to ignore this book is to ignore the Word of God, the last message that God sent to this planet, to all of us as believers, that we need to have. Now, the whole book of Re Revelation is there to encourage. It's written, uh, uh, it can be read, it can be heard, but it's written for all believers of all time. Yet, I, I share with you that we talk about the audience, the modern audience, Revelation today is seen more as a mystery. It's seen as something to be avoided. I would say that probably 95% of the churches never hear a message from the book of Revelation because their pastors are afraid of it. I will share with you that when some pastors come to the book of Revelation, pastors I know, they will call me up and say, what do we believe? I've had that happen on several occasions. I've had pastors call me up and say, my people want me to preach on it. What should I do? And I say, well, preach on it. And they go, but I don't understand it. And then I always tell them the same thing. Buy my book, it'll help. But it is ignored. Revelation is often regulated in our society to scholars who write long books. I have... I have a whole set of books at home. I just, I'm just i in the process of reading two more, as if I needed two more books in Revelation. My wife was like, just two more is all you need, right? It's regulated to scholars and sem uh, seminars and seminaries. There are flow charts and people, and there are certain uh, groups that like to take Revelation and turn it into a, a way to sneak people or trick people into coming to their churches. Movies are made to represent the beasts and the dragons that will descend upon the world without mercy. And it's all taken out of context for the movie industry. 
It's intended to be part of the Bible for a reason. It's a message we need today. It's a message that we can learn from and apply to our lives. I believe that with all of my hearts. We are the audience for the book of Revelation. We are to read it. We are to hear it. In fact, I encourage you to do both, to read it. And you can go online if you don't know any, you haven't done it before, and look up a place where the book of Revelation is, like Bible Gateway, and you can listen to it while you read it. It's a great way to get through it especially with some of the names and some of the things that are happening in there. And then there's the author. Now, we know this man. He is John, the son of Debedee, Zebedee and Salome, and he's the younger brother of James. His mother, Salome, is uh, one of the people who goes with Jesus and ministers to Jesus Christ. She was one of the three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of uh, James, and uh, Salome, who was the mother of um, James and John, they're the three women who went to the well to, I mean, went to the tomb that morning to anoint Jesus Christ to find his body. John the Apostle is called by Jesus while he is uh, setting in a boat repairing fishing nets and is one of the twelve called by Jesus to be an apostle, and he is part of the inner circle, the three that are closest to Jesus Christ. He sat next to Jesus Christ at the Last Supper and leaned over and spoke to him and was one to ask who was going to betray Jesus. Along with Peter, he also followed Jesus into the place of the high priest after his arrest, but remember, Peter took off and ran away. John, who writes this book and speak, God speaks through, he is the only disciple who stayed near Jesus Christ at the foot of the cross of Calvary while he was dying. He is the one that Jesus gave responsibility of taking care of his mother. He said, John, this is your mother. Take care of her. John wrote five books. He wrote the Gospel of John someplace between 70 and 80 or 85 A.D. That great, powerful book written, uh, excuse me, 75 to 85 A.D. He wrote three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and between 90 and 95 A.D. And finally, he writes his fifth book, The Revelation. When I say he writes it, he is writing down what he's told to write down. He is a, um, a conduit for God, for Jesus Christ to speak to us. He is the last living apostle. He's in his 90s at least at this particular point of time. He's an old man. He is the, he is the last one who ever walked with Jesus and sat by a fire with him and knew what he was like, and people loved to hear him. And it appears that he has been... Um, exiled to this island, which we'll talk about a little bit more next week. And understand, in, in Rome, when someone was being punished, Rome did not look at punishment the way we do. We, 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 if we were going to go back and, and compare what was wrong, remember, Jesus Christ is dying on the cross, and the people beside him are what? They are thieves. They may be pickpockets, but they're just thieves. In Rome, if you were a criminal, they dealt with you. They didn't have prisons. They didn't rehabilitate you. They figured you were bad enough they were going to deal with you at that particular point. Now, there was a second type of uh, point where they would take somebody who was they weren't going to kill, but they were going to make suffer, and they would send them to a salt mine or send them someplace to work hard labor. And the purpose of that was them to die a very cruel death. And then there was a third point. And they use this for political prisoners, and you know, emperors would do this to each other, and they did it in the church, even in the, even in the first, second, third century. Uh, this, this bishop would be over all the other bishops, and this guy would make him mad, so they'd do this, they'd, they'd, they'd exile him. and send him away. So you can't be in Rome anymore, get out. And that's what's happened to John. John has been told, you have to get out, and the only place we're going to let you go is this little island. You're going to be out there in this island, and you're going to stay there. And so John's on the island. He's been exiled. He, he probably has no guards around him or anything like that. He's just told he can't go back to the main part. And as John is there on this island, Jesus Christ comes and speaks to him. Hey, I got a message for you. Always love it when the enemy of our soul thinks he's won, and Jesus says, oh, now, now you got him secluded, and people are going to leave him alone. I can get him to write one more thing for me. Write this down. So here is the last living apostle prepared to be used of Jesus Christ one more time. And then we come to the theme of the book, which is the apocalypse. 
It is called the book of Revelation, and the first line in every single translation we'll read says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation there is the word apocalypse, which means, which in some dictionaries want to tell you, and by the way, they're wrong before I go any further. It says, the word apocalypse is a great disaster or series of very bad events associated with destruction and great loss. That's how the world looks at the book of Revelation. It's a series of bad events, you know, associated with destruction and great loss, and most of the time they think about the end of everything. That's not what the word apocalypse means. That's not what the word revelation means. In fact, the word revelation is the Greek word apocalypse is not about destruction. It literally means to uncover or reveal. And that is what the book of Revelation is for, to uncover or reveal what God wants us to see. And we're here this morning, and God wants to uncover, reveal His truth from the book of Revelation for all of us. The apocalypse of, the apocalypse of Revelation of what Jesus has shown John is going to be passed on to the church. Now let's look at these three verses for just a minute. And these three verses contain what I consider, uh, I would break down into three, uh, three particular parts of this particular one. First, this part is the prologue. In the prologue, we learn that God the Father speaks to Jesus the Son and gives Him a message. And Jesus the Son takes the message and gives it to the angel. And the angel takes the message and gives it to John, who most translations say he's a bondservant. Folks, that's a terrible word because it doesn't make him who he is. John saw himself as a slave. He could serve no one else and do nothing else except what Jesus Christ wanted him to do. He saw him. The word is doulos. It means slave. In Rome, the 40% of the population or more were slaves, and they could only do what they were told to do. And John writes, takes everything he's heard and seen, except for the part he's told not to, which we'll talk about. And he writes it down, and he gets seven copies of it, and he sends it to the churches, to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And these churches read it, and we'll talk about the response that should have happened to them. And then that letter is now passed on to you and I. And the letter is relevant for us today. I want you to think about, it. we read the book of uh, Luke and Acts, and we apply them to our lives, even though they're written to a man named Theophilus 2,000 years ago. Because they are relevant, because the truth is there. We need to take the book of Revelation, and we need to read it and apply it to our lives, even though it's written to those seven churches, it still applies to us. It is still truth, and we need to apply. God preserved it by getting it out there. Now, we together, and I want to put an emphasis, I want to go back to the thing about John being a slave for a minute. I want to say that the Bible says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness? We're a slave to somebody. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. If you want to call yourself a bondservant and feel better about it, that's right away. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. He is my Lord and He is my Master. And when we take a look at the vision of Jesus Christ next week, you'll understand why that is really important. So first comes the pre prologue. And in this prologue, there is a promise. And this promise, it says, blessed or fortunate is the believer that what? This carries the concept of receiving benefits of God's grace, God's power. The act or action of the believing, believer is rewarded. We're rewarded for, I almost couldn't say that, rewarded for reading this book. We are rewarded for hearing this book. We are rewarded for applying this book to our lives, which we will do before this series is over. The book of Revelation is meant to be experienced and shared with others. It is not meant to be the last book in the Bible that you just take a look at and you go, oh, I see it there, but I'm not going to read that. It's too hot for me. It's pepperex. It's more than, more than I could take. The third thing in the book of Revelation is about the prophecy. In this first opening section, it requires heeding or applying the truth learned here to a person's life. He says the time is near. The time is always near. 
Now, some of you say, well, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus Christ was been here. That's a long time. But if a 1,000 years is like a day to the Lord, Jesus has been gone how long? Two days. And if Jesus Christ has been gone two days, it's not very long, and the time is still near. The time is near for both a warning and a comfort. The warning to alert um, and a comfort that will, God will not be caught off guard. We're being warned what's going to happen. If you know what's going to happen in advance, you, you can do, deal with it. You can do the right thing. Prophecy is to tell forth or preach or to foretell or show the future. This does both. This is both a book of preaching and a book of showing the future of what's coming next. Now, this brings me to the end of where we are this morning. And I want to say this, and I want you to hear me. Revelation is Pepper X. And I want to say three things this morning about it. First, you do not get to choose the heat. God does that. So God decided that we all get the hot pepper book of the Bible. We get to share it. We get to read it. We get to study it. Now, don't any of you go out and get the Carolina Reaper and take a bite of it and blame me, because I'm telling you not to do that. You know? But I want all of you here this morning to know and hear me when I say, we don't get to choose the heat. God is choosing the heat. Here is Revelation, and Jesus shows us the infamous pepper X of prophecies that is there for all of us to have and think about. And finally... This may be why so many avoid or ignore the book of Revelation, because it's too hot to handle. Too hot for them at this particular point in time. So we come to, this is the first three verses. And it says that we're blessed if we read. We're blessed if we hear. And he says, we're blessed if we apply it to our lives. Now, I want to stop and I want to talk to you for a second about what we're going to do next week, because I think it's important. If you'll go to your Bibles and read the rest of the chapter of Revelation, the first chapter of Revelation, verses 4 through 20, you will find that it is a greeting and a declaration. And when I talk about it being a declaration, I want you to know that this is about authority and power. This sets up the entire book of Revelation, these two things right here for us. The declaration we're going to see next week is not any declaration. It's not just like, oh, this book's important to read. This book will talk about who you and I are compared to Jesus Christ. And then it turns around and gives us a new image of Jesus. And right here, I think, is so very, very important for us to have. Because when we talk about it, I think that you know, have to understand the book of Revelation does away with the image most people have of Jesus. There are no Bergenstocks on a dusty road. There is no long robe with a belt made out of rope wrapped around. There's no long hair with flowers and like the little children's book, butterflies all around him. This isn't the Jesus Christ of Revelation. And when we come to the next week, we will see Jesus Christ as he is today, not as he used to be when he walked around the earth, as he is today. And I want to say there won't be any crowds gathered around Jesus Christ singing Jesus Christ Superstar. There'll be no Hosanna, Santa, Santa, Hosanna, Hannah, Santa, Santa, Tana, whatever. We will hear in the book of Revelation, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We will see the 24 elders fall before the throne. We will hear the message roll down from heaven and speak to us in such a way that it should change us who we are. Now remember, John, who spent three years with Jesus, John, who was there at the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, spent those 40 days with him. John, who saw him go to heaven. The book of Revelation we'll see next week. John is there. He, he, he's listening to what's happening. The angels, everything's happening. And all of a sudden, he turns and he sees Jesus Christ. And the Bible says the moment he saw him, this Jesus Christ we'll talk about next week, the Jesus Christ you'll read about this week, the moment he saw Jesus, did he go, hey, Jesus, good to see you, buddy? The Bible says he was so overcome with the way Jesus looked and with his appearance and who he was, he fell at his feet as if he was dead. Bam! And Jesus says, John, get up. We got to talk. the declaration of who we are, 
and the image of who Jesus is changes the book of Revelation and why it's there and what it means and what God wants to say to us. So each and every one of us, I pray, will take the time as we go through this study to understand this is the hot pepper sauce, this is the pepper X, and God wants us to apply it to our lives. You ready to go on? Amen. Let's take a minute and bow our heads, shall we? Dear Jesus, we come before you this morning. We thank you that your word is powerful and true. And Jesus, I want to tell you, we're not afraid to read the book of Revelation. We're not afraid to hear the book of Revelation. We're not afraid to know what's there. We want to know what's there. And Jesus, we're not going to play this game with all these people that are running around going, oh, it's the apocalypse, it's the end. When Jesus, we know it's not about the apocalypse, it's about what you want to reveal to us. So reveal your truth to us, we pray. Jesus, I pray for the church. I know there are uh, those that are sick. Some are home with COVID. We pray for those who have other conditions they're dealing with. Some are short-term, some are long-term. Jesus, we pray for the needs of this church, financial, spiritual, emotional, that you would intervene in people's lives and help them. We pray the message of this church, that we would speak for you and speak truth and be a church that we would be headed towards getting a good report from you. Jesus, we lift up before you our church, its ministry, and all we're about to do, and we say it's in your name. We pray. Amen. I'd like to encourage you to remember that we do need your support, both locally and those people online. This is what we, uh, we, uh, I don't like to say it sometimes, but we have to pay the bills like everybody else. We, we do the best we can, but we have to do that. And you also support the ministry and our outreach by supporting this church. And we pray that those online will go to sunrisechurch.com, click on the giving button. And if you've never given before, whether you want to give every week, every month, or just one time, we encourage you to do it. And for you sitting here before me this morning, I know about your giving. You're, you've been faithful. Praise God. We've come through this pandemic, and, and uh, we're doing better than a lot of churches. We're not perfect, but we're doing a lot better than a lot of the churches. I thank you for that. Now, as far as announcements, we continue the series in the book of Revelation for the next, uh, next period of time. We're going to be in this for a while, folks. And we're going to take one step at a time and go through it. And next week we finish out the introduction and we'll go from there. Now, I'm finishing up this morning a little bit different. So I've got a song for you. My wife doesn't know about this. She's looking at me and I'm like, uh-oh. So we talked about Bell peppers and banana peppers and habaneros, right? You got that, you know, zero, 500, 3,500. Well, this song is kind of all three levels. It starts out as a bell pepper. You're all going to be going like, I love this song. I know this song. And then it's going to go up part of the time to a banana pepper level. You're going to go like, oh, okay, we've done stuff like this. Before. And then a couple of times it goes to, to, to habanero level. And if you're not into that, you got to understand, I love this song the way they presented it. I'm a child of the 60s. I remember the Beatles and Three Dog Night and Steppenwolf and all those other great groups, you know? You know? So this song kind of fits in there. And it's a great old song, and we're going to do it. We have this version this week. Next week, I have another version of the same song, which is also great, but it's a little more, you know, traditional. So this morning, we're going to close out our service with a song that I think represents the book of Revelation and the introduction and where we are so well. So this morning, we're going to finish up. I'm going to say that to each and one of you, thank you for being here. Thanks for watching online. To people online, we're going to keep you online for this because it's worth doing. But until we get a chance to be back next week, I want to say God bless. And let's sing along if you want to.
victory, the victory in Jesus. He's my Savior. 